so. I have no fame, power, money, desire, none whatsoever. I have no employees. One secretary works for myself and my wife. I live in an isolated place, a town of 27,000 people. I am not ambitious. I'm not trying to make my life bigger. I'm doing none of the things that many of you are doing it. But I really am aware of my ignorance. And being aware of my ignorance, in some ways, makes me more powerful than you. Because I'm centered. I'm centered on my desire to find a path of something that interests me and to connect that path to something that I can understand. I don't care about your well-being. I don't care about the well-being of the world. I care about doing good work. And I believe if you do good work, it has an effect. If you try to have an effect, it changes your work. I don't want anybody to change my work. I want to do as good work as I possibly can. I hate panels. I think panels stink. I don't think that's the way you think. I think having, why is a chair back there? Chair should be here. Why do you have round tables where half the people are not facing the stage? Why, what's in that little no man's land there? Why aren't you right next to me? I had to insist for the house lights to be on so I could see you. Everything I do is dumb. It was not a smart thing. I just said there, everybody could think of that. Why stand, you know why people stand behind a podium? To protect your groin. <laughs> why do you want to protect your groin? Because it, it's scary up here. <laughs> and you have a place to put something down so you can read it. In, uh, what was it, 13... 1340, I think. 1340? Yeah, I think. 1340, Gutenberg uh, in Mons, Germany, put together, uh, developed movable type. The Chinese did it 500 years before, but we didn't know about it. Uh, maybe the Chinese knew about it, but they, they did it for a different reason. He really did it to print a book. They did it to do prints of pictures and things like that. It wasn't really movable type. They did printing and things of that sort with plates. Uh, he and his brother uh, refitted a wine press into a printing press, printed 48 Bibles. That's all he printed was 48 Bibles, or 180 Bibles, I'm sorry. A few 48 lines, a couple 42 lines. Not many of them. That was invention of the printing press and printing and movable type. One interesting thing he did is he did 126 letters because he cut letters so that they perfectly fit next to each other. Uh, and it comes out that you need 126 of them to get a perfectly set book. Um, the man who started uh, uh, Adobe, and Adobe is the chief supplier of type and everything, uh, said they still have not been able to do a computer program that's and do a book set better than the first book that was printed, the Gutenberg Bible. They can't do it better than that. Uh, even with the computer, at least that was 10 years ago, maybe now they have, but 10 years ago he said they couldn't. He had to sort of fool around and invent a kind of paper that you could dampen and put it on the press. He had invented ink, which was mostly water-based, so the, uh, it was uh, because they had painted things, he had to have an oil-based ink, so he could roll it on. Boy, you talk about innovation. He had the press, the paper, the ink, the letters. That's innovation. That's really a group of innovative things. The interesting story is he, he died bankrupt because he midway through had to borrow a lot of money and couldn't pay it back. He and his brother died bankrupt. Uh, the money that was to be made out of the first printing of anything was made by the Catholic Church that printed indulgences, uh, which was a way that rich people could buy, a way of not having to go and confess in church. Martin Luther riled against that. That's one of the points that they put up in the Lutheran Church, the, the indulgences. Now the interesting thing I'm going to tell you. 
It took 99 years from the first book that came out for somebody to come up the, with the idea to number the pages. So you could find something. And that act of trying to find something has driven a lot of businesses since then. That's finding something is kind of the beginning of search. <laughs> This desire, this deep-seated desire to find something. You know, if I throw down 140,000 words, which is the number of words that are in a normal college dictionary, that's not a dictionary. I mean, it's not, a, it's not usable. It's 140,000 words on the floor. If you attach some meaning to the words, put them in alphabetical order, you have a dictionary. You group them in subject areas, you have the beginning of an encyclopedia. The words don't change. But how you organize them changes it. The organization of information actually changes information. And there are only five ways of organizing information. Uh, you can organize them by location, alphabet, time, category, and hierarchy. There's no other ways. I believe there's only five ways of innovation. By addition, need, opposite, subtraction, and epiphany. Those two things amount to another speech. The, um, they want me off. And I'm only halfway through. So I'll go back to the Urban Observatory for a minute and tell you why it's interesting. It's interesting because it lives off the cloud. It's interesting because it affects most everybody on Earth. It's interesting because you put off taking action until you understand things as a kind of basic way of living your life. It's interesting because if it's true that you only understand something relative to something you understand, it affects not only urban information, but it affects healthcare, it affects almost anything. It's a different way of living your life. It's a different way of trying to say, do I understand or not? A different way of asking questions, of asking meaningful questions. Throughout the years, I don't take questions normally from an audience because I found that of 80% of all the questions, not 100%, every once in a while there's a good question, but 80% of the questions from an audience are either speeches or bad questions. Speeches are just, I can't bear it. I can't bear somebody getting up. I gave him a speech, somebody else is giving a speech. And, uh, you know, bad questions puts me in the position of being even more abrasive than I normally am. And then I don't like myself and I feel, why did I do that? You, you, you shouldn't have done that. But I can't help it. A bowl is around the corner from us. Let me tell you a, a, two disaster stories to end, because it's a nice way to end the morning, and it'll, it'll lower the applause I get. <laughs> I won't tell a, a family story. You always get applause with family stories. I won't tell family stories. I could tell a story about my eight-year-old who wins the 10K in, in uh, Boulder, Colorado, but I won't. Um, The Black Plague, when it hit uh, Europe, came across Asia, across the Silk Road, came in generally thought of through Toulon and Genoa, and is thought of as coming in from uh, rats and fleas that lived on the rats that jumped off the rats and infected people, and half the people in Europe died. It was a terrible catastrophe. Part of what they don't tell you is that um, things were really lousy in Europe at that time. People were starving. Uh, things were in shambles. There wasn't enough to eat. Um, after the Black Plague ran its course about five years, there was a lot to eat. There was only half the mouths to feed. But they didn't have enough people to farm. So there was an enormous, enormous uh, market for figuring out how you can farm and how you can weave cloth without as many people. 
And the industrial part of the Renaissance in Europe happened as a result. It was an unintended consequence. I'm not suggesting, suggesting that a black plague was a positive thing. That's not the purpose of what I'm saying. What I am saying is there are unintended consequences to everything that we propose that's a game changer of things happening. The Northwest Passage, which will be open in five years, is going to change shipping. It's going to change this port. Some for the good, some for the bad, some different. Don't buy stock in Nicaragua Canal, the new canal they're building down there. Um, at dinner two nights ago, we were talking about not only is it going to change shipping, it might help in the, it might accelerate some of the release of uh, methane that is bubbling up in that area. That's really deadly. If you want to do a little research, you ought to not only look into the methane up there in the Arctic, but look at the methane lake in the Caribbean, frozen methane that's a lake under the Caribbean that has in it the, perhaps the oldest living creatures on Earth more than a mile down, some tube worms. And the black smokers in the Pacific, which were found in 1999, which have the fastest growing creatures on Earth, both of those creatures living off of chemosynthesis, not off of photosynthesis. Everything you were taught, if you're, well, my age, there's not many people my age here, but uh, even 10, 15 years younger than me, everything you were taught in school is 100% wrong. Uh, we were all taught that the atom was the smallest particle. At the same time we were taught that, we were told that it was made up of three other particles, neutron, proton, electron. I never understood that, but you didn't question it because you'd get the answer wrong. No, it's the atom, right? And now there's 16 subatomic particles and they're gonna find more. We were told that everything was from photosynthesis and now we know more life probably comes from chemosynthesis. When they finally discovered or just thought they discovered the black hole, they said it was the the biggest vacuum on Earth and all the science fiction movies had things sucked into it. And now they believe, they believe, I'm not saying it's true, they believe that it is the densest place in the universe. Uh, a few years ago, chocolate was bad for you, then it was good for you, then it was bad for you, then it was good for you, then it was bad for you, then it was good for you. Fat was good for you, fat was bad for you, fat is good for you, fat is bad for you. Coffee, good for you, bad for you, good for you, good for you, good for you, bad for you. I mean, you understand how we get information? <laughs> Some people were starving themselves, starving themselves, because the thinner you were, if you were really emaciated, there was a whole club of people doing that. They had a 60 minutes program. You could live to be 110 if you were really ema you know, emaciated. Then that was proven wrong. But they did a 60 minutes piece that probably had a lot of people starve themselves to death. Well, I think I really have to get off. I have so many things I wrote down this morning. I'll see if there's anything important that I wrote down this morning. I took this very seriously, but I didn't, I didn't really hit everything here. Oh, this is interesting. This will be my last one, because it's about today. In many of my speeches, I did a whole, we talked about this the other night too, David. In many of my uh, speeches, I was fascinated with this volcano that's spelled L-A-K-I, so you'd think it's pronounced Lackey, but it's pronounced Larky, that it's in Iceland. Uh, and I was fascinated that I was never taught about that volcano. And it's in the range of history that I knew a lot of other things. Uh, it was 1783, it's in America, that's a big date. The Constitution, a lot of stuff happens. Then 1776, we were founded from Philadelphia, the Constitution was written there. 83 was one of these years we, when we studied American history, we studied that period of time a great deal, the Revolutionary War, but never heard about this volcano going off in Iceland. I started reading about it, and the, one of the main reasons we know about it is Benjamin Franklin, that I think somebody mentioned here, or maybe it was in Taipei, but somebody mentioned it in this last few days about him being such an important American and such an innovative person. He was in Paris, 
He was sort of a rake, a very famous, smart rake of a man, and, and strange looking. You know, he was bald with long hair. And um, he wrote about this, uh, this stream of, uh, of uh, clouds that was blocking out the sun in Paris. He was in Paris. So Larky went off in Iceland. This stream, I'm, uh, this is a, oh, I thought he was coming to get me, and I was going to say, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm winding this up. Um, this stream comes down across Paris, blots out the sun for a whole growing season. There's no wheat. There's starvation, just terrible starvation. Believed to be one of the significant reasons for the revolution in France. Let them eat cake. They couldn't grow wheat. They were starving. It then goes down across Europe, over the Nile Valley, and then it goes across to India. And they estimate about five million people die. And we never study it. I hope you people from India study it, because it was a disaster in India, but it is not, believe me, in any American history book. Why is that interesting? Well, Larky is doming today. You've probably read about it. And uh, I'm going to Iceland next week. And uh, it's been doming for a while, but it's now rumbling. And it's maybe 70 miles to the east of where the one went off two years ago that you can't pronounce, uh, which only went off for about a day and stopped air traffic uh, for about three or four weeks. I mean, it was kind of disastrous. And last, and this is magnitudes. Magnitudes is a good word to use when you're talking about magnum. But magnitudes uh, larger uh, than the one that went off a little while ago. Unintended consequences are fascinating. There's going to be an inoculation, vaccination for, for malaria probably in the next four years, and a million people won't die every year. And those million people, by and large, are in places they don't have enough to eat now. The unintended consequences of something that's going to happen and should happen is that there are going to be a lot of starving, a lot of starving kids, unless that's part of the whole getting out Things. There's things that happen from each thing we do. That doesn't mean we should stop doing them. That was a quiet ending. <laughs> Sorry for running over. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, Richard promised to take some bad questions, but only from me. How are you doing? <laughs> Thank I've... you very much. Right, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Richard Saul Verman. Thank you. A small token of appreciation. <laughs>